Good evening everyone, this is Wayne over at the Alchemical Tech Revolution YouTube channel. I apologize, I haven't posted anything in a couple of weeks here. It's been a very busy and crazy time, uh, both personally and, uh, you know, in the, the sphere of uh, uh, business and, and things like that as well. So uh, I haven't had much time to sit and record, but I, I do intend to uh, start producing some more material here very soon. And we're going to start tonight. Uh, by looking at an old book here. And this book is a very telling kind of a book uh, as far as the teachings of the mystery schools. And, you know, all these secret teachings that these uh, orders and uh, brotherhoods like to keep to themselves and not really uh, give away to the quote-unquote profane. Uh, so we're going to take a look at this tonight. This book we're looking at is called Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire by Manley P. Hall. Uh, this was published originally in 1926, and it is a treatise in three parts. And tonight we're going to start uh, towards the bottom of the introduction part and get right into the first part of the book here. And I'm probably going to break this down into a, uh, a two-part series because it's, it's a lengthy book. Uh, but I think it's worth going through a lot of the material presented in here. So I'm going to do this as part one of Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire. And uh, <clears throat> like I said, we'll start towards the end of the introduction and go right into the first part of the book. So I will be quoting right from the book here. Uh, let us begin here. <clears throat> and I'm starting on page eight here towards the end of the introduction. Man is never truly wise until he has fathomed the rhythm, or sorry, excuse me, let's start that again. Man is never truly wise until he has fathomed the riddle of his own existence, and the temples of initiation are the only repositories of that knowledge, a knowledge which will enable him to unfasten the Gordian knot of his own nature. Still, the great spiritual truths are not so deeply concealed as might be supposed. Most of them are exposed to view at all times, but are not recognized because of their concealment in symbol and allegory. When the human race learns to read the language of symbolism, a great veil will fall from the eyes of men. They shall then know truth, and, more than that, they shall realize that from the beginning truth has been in the world unrecognized, save by a small but gradually increasing number appointed by the lords of the dawn as ministers to the needs of human creatures struggling to regain their consciousness of divinity. The supreme arcanum of the ancients was the key to the nature and power of fire. From the day when the hierarchies first descended upon the sacred island of the polar ice cap, it has been decreed that fire should be the supreme symbol of the mysterious, abstract divinity which moves in God, man, and nature. The sun was looked upon as a great fire burning in the mists of the universe. In the burning orb of the sun dwelt the mysterious spirits controlling fire, and in honor of this great light, fires burned upon the altars of countless nations. The fire of Zeus burned upon the Pal Palatine Hill, the fire of Vesta upon the altar of the home, and the fire of aspiration upon the altar of the soul. And that's the end of the introductory part, folks. <clears throat> and as you can see right there, uh, Mr. Hall points out that uh, it's very important that we understand to learn to read the language of symbolism. Uh, because when we do that, then we can start to see these mysteries that these people have concealed through the ages in these different symbols and allegories and ideas. And uh, he's talking about uh, fire here as being uh, one of the key aspects here. And that's what this book's about. So we're going to get right into part one here now. And uh, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and, like I usually do, I'll give my uh, commentary on the side as I see the need to, to stop and maybe clarify some things or add my uh, opinions, my humble opinions to things. But let's continue on. <clears throat> Part 1. Fire, the Universal Deity. Since the earliest times, man has venerated the element of fire above all others. Even the most untutored savage seems to recognize in the flame something closely resembling the volatile fire within his soul. The mysterious, vibrant, radiant energy of fire was beyond his ability to analyze, yet he felt its power. 
The fact that during thunderstorms fire descended in mighty bolts from heaven, felling trees and otherwise dealing destruction, caused the primogenial human being to recognize in its fury the anger of the gods. Later, when man personified the elements and created the multitudinous pantheons which now exist, he placed in the hand of his supreme deity the torch, the thunderbolt, or the flaming sword, and upon his head a crown, its gilded points symbolizing the flaming rays of the sun. Mystics have traced sun worship back to early Lemuria and fire worship to the origin of the human race. In fact, the element of fire controls to a certain degree both the plant and animal kingdoms, and is the only element which can subjugate the metals. Either consciously or instinctively, every living thing honors the orb of day. The sunflower always faces the solar disk. The Atlanteans were sun worshippers, while the American Indians, remnants of the earlier Atlantean people, still regard the sun as the proxy of the supreme light giver. Many early peoples believed that the sun was reflector rather than source of light, as is evidenced by the fact that they often pictured the sun god as carrying on his arm a highly polished shield, on which was chased the solar face. This shield, catching the light of the infinite one, reflected it to all parts of the universe. During the year, the sun passes through the twelve houses of the heavens, where, like Hercules, it performs twelve labors. The annual death and resurrection of the sun has been a favorite theme among unnumbered religions. The names of nearly all the great gods and saviors have been associated with either the element of fire, the solar light, or its correlate, the mystic and spiritual light invisible. Jupiter, Apollo, Hermes, Mithras, Bacchus, Dionysus, Odin, Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, Zarathustra, Fohi, Io, Vishnu, Shivna, Agni, Baldur, Hiram Abiff, Moses, Samson, Jason, Vulcan, Uranus, Allah, Osiris, Ra, Bel, Baal, Nebo, Serapis, and King Solomon are some of the numerous deities and supermen whose symbolic attributes are derived from the manifestations of the solar power and whose names indicate their relationship to light and fire. <coughs> According to the Greek mysteries, the gods, gazing down from Mount Olympus, repented that they had made men, and never having given, given to the primitive creature an immortal spirit, they decided that no harm would be done if the quarreling, dissenting human ignates, ingrates sorry, were destroyed forever and the place where they had been left vacant for a nobler race. Discovering the plans of the gods, Prometheus, in whose heart was a great love for struggling humanity, determined to bring to mankind the divine fire, which would make the human race immortal so that not even the gods could destroy it. So Prometheus flew to the home of the sun god and, Lighting a tiny reed with the solar fire, he carried it to the children of the earth, warning them that the fire should always be used for the glorification of the gods and the unselfish service of each other. But men were thoughtless and unkind. They took the divine fire brought them by Prometheus and used it to destroy one another. They burned the homes of their enemies, and with the aid of heat they tempered steel, making swords and armor. They grew more selfish and more arrogant, defying the gods, but they could not be destroyed, for they possessed this sacred fire. For his disobedience, Prometheus, like Lucifer, was chained, but the Greek hero was placed upon the brow of Mount Caucasus there to remain with a vulture gnawing at his liver until a human being should master the sacred fire and become perfect. This prophecy was fulfilled by Hercules, who climbed Mount Caucasus, broke the fetters of Prometheus, and liberated the friend of man who had been in torture for so many ages. Hercules represents the initiate who, as his name implies, partakes of the glory of light. Prometheus is the vehicle of solar energy. The divine fire which he brought to men in a, is a mystic essence in their own natures, which they must redeem and regenerate if they would liberate their own crucified souls from the rock of their base physical natures. <coughs> According to occult philosophy, the sun, in reality, is a threefold orb, two parts of its nature being invisible. 
The globe which we see is merely the lowest phase of the solar nature and is the body of the Demiurgus, or as the Jews call him, Jehovah, and the Brahmins, Shiva. The sun being symbolized by an equilateral triangle, the three powers of the solar disk are said to be co-equal. The three phases of the sun are called will, wisdom, and action. Will is related to the principle of life, wisdom to the principle of light, and action, or friction, to the principle of heat. By will, the heavens were created, and the eternal life continued in supreme existence. By action, friction, and striving, the earth was formed, and the physical universe, molded by the lords of the fire mist, passed gradually from its molten condition into its present and more orderly state. Thus, heaven and nature were formed, but between these two was a great void, for God did not comprehend nature, and nature did not comprehend the deity. The lack of intercourse between these two spheres of consciousness was similar to the condition of paralysis in which the consciousness realizes the condition of its body, but owing to the lack of nerve connection, it is incapable of governing or directing the activities of the body. Therefore, between life and action, there came a mediator, which was called light, or intelligence. Light partakes of both life and action. It is the sphere of blending. Intelligence stood between heaven and earth, for through its medium man learned of the existence of his God, and God began his ministration to the needs of men. While both life and action were simple substances, light was a compound, for the invisible part of light was of the nature of heaven, and the visible part of the nature of earth. Down through the ages this light is said to have taken upon itself bodies. Although these bodies have borne witness to that light, the great spiritual truth behind the symbol of the embodied light is that in the soul of every creature within whose mind intelligence is born, there dwells a spirit which assumes the nature of this intelligence. Every truly intelligent man and woman who is working to spread light in the world is Christened or lightened by the actual labor which he or she is seeking to perform. The fact that light, and it says in parentheses here, intelligence, partakes of the natures of both God and the earth is proved by the names given to the personifications of this light for at one time they are called the sons of men and at another time the sons of God. <clears throat> I'm going to pause there, folks. A lot of information in here, huh? So, basically, what uh, Mr. Hall is saying here is he's kind of uh, reiterating some things that we've talked about in the past. He's talking about, uh, you know, these, these different uh, uh, principles of uh, Demiurgus. Uh, which he equates to Jehovah, and that that's an interesting thing, and we'll, we'll go down that line of thought here later, and we'll see just what it is that many of these people in these brotherhoods think of Jehovah, or what we in the Christian world would consider to be God, or the Creator, and we'll see what they have to say about that, and we also see that he uh, equates the Holy Trinity here uh, to this idea of will, wisdom, and action, which is very similar to what uh, many of what they would call the quote-unquote Illuminati had referred to as uh, uh, the, the principles of um, will, action, and uh, what's the other one I'm missing here? It's, it's the same basic idea. Oh, thought. Thought, action, and will. Uh, those are the, the holy trinity of uh, those who uh, really go down down the darker paths of these things. So, <clears throat> and that's what we would call from the orders of Illuminati or, or whatever you want to call that. Uh, it's kind of become a catch-all phrase for many of these things, but uh, it was an actual secret society, and it was known at the time. But uh, let's get back to the reading here. So we left off here where he says that... Uh, <clears throat> the personifications of this light, for at one time they're called sons of men, and at another time the sons of God. So let's continue on. The initiate in the mysteries was always instructed concerning the existence of three sons. The first of which, the vehicle for God the Father, enlightened and warmed his spirit. The second, the vehicle of God the Son, unfolded and broadened his mind. 
The third, the vehicle of God, the Holy Spirit, nourished and strengthened his body. Light is not only a physical element, it is also a mental and spiritual element, and in the temple, the disciple is told to revere the invisible sun even more than the visible one, for every visible thing is only an effect of the invisible or causal, and as God is the cause of all causes, he dwells in the invisible world of causation. Going to pause there, folks. That's important. Let's pay attention to this concept here because this is a a very deep spiritual truth. Uh, You know, however, uh, Mr. Hall intends it here, this is a truth. Um, You see, it says here that uh, for every visible thing, it's only an effect of the invisible or causal. And as God is the cause of all causes, he dwells in the invisible world of causation. So, you see, there's an invisible world all around us that we can't really see or sense, per se. Um, but it's it's a world of causation and, and where things begin their, um, their manifestation. And, you know, then eventually come to this physical plane and manifest here. So, that's what this is talking about. But let's continue on. <clears throat> Apuleius, when initiated into the mysteries, beheld the sun shining at midnight, for the chambers of the temple were brilliantly illuminated, although there were no lamps of any kind. The invisible sun is not limited by walls, nor even the surface of the earth itself, for its rays being of higher vibratory rate than physical substance, its light passes unimpeded through all the planes of physical substance. To those capable of seeing the light of these spiritual orbs, there is no darkness, for they dwell in the presence of limitless light, and at midnight see the sun shining under their feet. By means of one of the lost arts of antiquity, the priests of the temple were able to manufacture lamps which would burn for centuries without replenishment. The lamps resembled what is commonly called the virgin lamps, or those carried by the Vestal Virgins. They were a little smaller than a human hand, and, according to uh, available records, their wicks were made of asbestos. It has been maintained that these lamps have burned for a thousand years or more. One of them was found in the tomb of Christian Rosencruz, which had burned for 120 years without the supply of fuel being diminished. It is supposed that these lamps, which incidentally burned in hermetically sealed vaults without the aid of oxygen, were so constructed that the heat of the flame extracted from the atmosphere some substance which took the place of the original fuel as rapidly as the mysterious oil was consumed. Hargrave Jennings has collected numerous references concerning the times when and places where these lamps have been found. In the majority of cases, however, they went out shortly after the vaults were opened or else were broken in some strange way, so the secret was not discovered. Concerning these lamps, Mr. Jennings writes, The ancient Romans are said to have preserved lights in their sepulchres many ages by the oiliness of gold. Here steps in the art of the Rosicrucians. Resolved by hermetic methods into a liquid substance, and it is reported that at the dissolution of monasteries in the time of Henry VIII, there was found a lamp, which had then burned in a tomb from about 300 years after Christ, after Christ, nearly 1,200 years. Two of these subterranean lamps are to be seen in the Museum of Rarities at Leyden in Holland. One of these lamps in the papacy of Paul III, was found in the tomb of Tulia, so named Cicero's daughter, which had been shut up 1,550 years. Madame Bovatsky, in Isis Unveiled, gives a number of formulae for making an of ever-burning lamps, and states in a footnote that she herself saw one, made by a disciple of the Hermetic Arts, which had burned steadily without fuel for six years previous to the publication of her book. The ever-burning lamp was, of course, a most appropriate symbol of the eternal fire in the universe, and while chemistry has denied the possibility of manufacturing them, the fact that many have been made and seen over a period of thousands of years is a warning against dogmatizing. In Tibet, the Lama magicians have discovered a system of lighting rooms by means of a luminous ball of phosphorescent greenish-white color, which increases in luminosity when ordered to do so by the priests, and after the departure of those who are in the chamber, it gradually becomes fainter until only a spark remains, which burns continuously. This apparent miracle is no more difficult to explain 
then another performed by the Tibetans. There is in Tibet a sacred tree, which sheds its bark annually, and as the old bark peels off, an inscription written in Tibetan characters is found upon the new bark underneath. These secrets of so-called savage and primitive peoples incessantly refute the ridicule with which Caucasians almost invariably view the culture of other races. The Druid priests in Britain, recognizing the sun as the proxy of the supreme deity, used a ray of solar light to start their altar fires. They did this by concentrating the ray upon a specially cut crystal or aquamarine, set in the form of a magic brooch or buckle upon the front of a belt of the archdruid. <coughs> this brooch was called Leoth Mysheth, and was supposed to possess the power of drawing the divine fire of the gods down from heaven and concentrating its energies for the service of men. The buckle was, of course, a burning glass. Many of the nations of antiquity so revered the fire and light of the sun that they would not permit their altars to be lighted by any other means than the concentration of the sun's rays through a burning glass. In certain of the ancient temples, specially arrayed, arranged lenses were placed in the ceiling at various angles so that each year, at the vernal equinox, the sun at high noon would send its rays through these glasses and light the altar fires which had been specially prepared for this occasion. The priests considered this process equivalent to the gods having actually lighted the fires themselves. In honor of Hu, the supreme deity of the Druids, the people of Britain and Gaul celebrated an annual lighting of fires on what they termed Midsummer's Day. One of the reasons why the mistletoe was sacred to the Druids was because many of the priests believed that this particular parasitic plant fell to the earth in the form of lightning bolts, and wherever a tree was struck by lightning, the seed of the mistletoe was placed within its bark. The great length of time the mistletoe remained alive after being cut from the tree had much to do with the veneration showered upon it by the Druids. That this plant was also a powerful medium for the collection of the mysterious cosmic fire circulating through the ethers was discovered by the early priests who valued mistletoe because of its close connection with the mysterious astral light, which in reality, which is in reality the astral body of the earth. Concerning this, Eliphas Levi writes in his History of Magic, the Druids were priests and physicians curing by magnetism and charging amulets with their fluidic influence. Their universal remedies were mistletoe and serpent's eggs because these substances attract the astral, astral light in a special manner. The solemnity with which mistletoe was cut down drew upon this plant the popular confidence and rendered it mat powerfully magnetic. The progress of magnetism will someday reveal to us the absorbing properties of mistletoe. We shall then understand the secret of those spongy growths which draw the unused virtues of plants and become surcharged with tinctures and savors. Mushrooms, truffles, gall on trees, and the different kinds of mistletoe will be employed with understanding by a med medical science, which will be new because it is old. Certain plants, minerals, and animals have been held sacred among the nations of the earth because of their peculiar sensitiveness to the astral fire. The cat, sacred to the city of Buba, Bubastis in Egypt, is an example of a peculiarly magnetized animal. Anyone stroking the fur of a domestic cat in a dark room can see the electrical emanations in the form of green phosphorescent light. In the temples of Bast, sacred to the cat goddess, three colored cats were viewed with unusual veneration, as was any member of the feline family whose two eyes were of different colors. Lodestone and radium in the mineral kingdom and various parasitic growths in the plant kingdom are strangely susceptible to the cosmic fire. The magicians of the Middle Ages surrounded themselves with certain animals, such as bats, cats, snakes, and monkeys, because they were able to borrow the power of the astral light from these creatures and appropriate it to their own uses. For this same reason, the Egyptians and certain of the Greeks kept cats in the temples, and serpents were always in evidence at the Oracle of Delphi. The auric body of a snake is one of the most remarkable sights that the clairvoyant will ever see, and the secrets concealed within its aura demonstrate why the serpent is the symbol of wisdom among so many nations. 
That Christianity has preserved, in part at least, the primitive fire worship of antiquity is evident in many of its symbols and rituals. The incense burner so often used in Christian churches is a pagan symbol relating to the regeneration of the human soul. The incense burner represents the body of man. The incense within the burner, made from the extracted essences of various plants, represents the life forces within the body of man. The flaming spark burning in the mists of the incense is emblematic of the spiritual germ concealed in the mists of the material organism of man. The spirit, this spiritual spark is an infinitesimal part of the divine flame, the great fire of the universe, from whose flaming heart the altar fires of all his creatures have been lighted. As the spark of life gradually consumes the incense, so the spiritual nature of man, through the process of regeneration, gradually consumes all the gross elements of the body, transmuting them into soul power, symbolized by smoke. Although smoke is actually a dense and physical substance, yet light enough to rise in clouds, so the soul is actually a physical element, but through purification and the fire of aspiration, it has taken upon itself the nature of intangible atmosphere. Though composed of the substance of earth, it becomes light enough to rise as a fragrant odor into the presence of deity. While some authorities have held that the form of the cross was derived from the ancient Egyptian instrument called the Nilometer, and used for measuring the inundations of the Nile, others hold the opinion that the symbol had its origin in the two crossed sticks used by primitive peoples to generate fire by friction. The use of the bell towers and campanelles in the construction of the cathedrals of medieval Christianity, also the more familiar conventionalized church steeple, may be traced to the fire obelisks of Egypt, which were placed in front of the temples sacred to the superior deities. All pyramids are symbols of fire, while the heart used on Valentine's Day is merely an inverted candle flame. The maypole had its origin in similar antiquity, where it is both a phallic symbol and an emblem of cosmic fire. The prevailing custom of having churches face the east is, uh, of course, further evidence of the survival of sun worship. Practically, the only branch of the human race that does not observe this rule is the Arabic. The Mohammedans face their mosques toward Mecca, but still have their appointed hours of prayer governed by the sun. The rose windows and ivy-covered walls are survivals of Pagandom, for ivy was sacred to Bacchus because of the shape of its leaf, and this plant was always allowed to trail over the walls of the temple sacred to the Greek solar deity. The golden ornaments upon the altars of Christian churches should remind the philosophical observer that gold is the sacred metal of the sun, because, according to alchemists, the sun ray itself crystallized in the earth, thus forming the precious metal, which, incidentally, is still being made. The candles, so often seen adoring, adorning the altars and most frequently appearing in an uneven number, are a reminder that un, the uneven numbers are sacred to the sun. When three candles are used, they symbolize the three aspects of the sun, sunrise, noon, and sunset, and are thus emblematic of the trinity. When seven are used, they represent the planetary angels called by the Jews Elohim, whose numerical and Kabbalistic values are also seven. When the even numbers 12 or 24 appear, they represent the signs of the zodiac and the spirits of the hour of the day called by the Persians the Izeds. When only one light is shown, it is the emblem of the supreme invisible father, who is one, and the little red lamp ever burning over the altar is an offering to the Demiurgus, Jehovah, or the Lord Builder of Forms. What oil is to the flame, blood is to the spirit of man. Therefore, oil is often used in anointing, for it is a fluid sacred to the solar power. Because oil contains the life of the sun, it is used in large quantities in far northern lands, where it is necessary to generate an abundance of body heat. Hence, the proclivity of the Eskimos for eating tallow candles and whale oil. The actual word Christ is itself sufficient proof that fire and the worship of fire are the two most essential elements of the Christian faith. 
The rays of light pouring from the sun were viewed by the ancients as the blood of the celestial lamb, which at the vernal equinox died for the sin of the world and redeemed all humanity through its blood. Rays, it says in parentheses. <coughs> the mystery schools of ancient Egypt taught that the blood was the vehicle of the consciousness. Going to pause right there, folks. Now you know why they are so fascinated with bloodlines and tracing bloodlines. And this is important, and this, this is also why there's always this fascination and fetish with blood with these people, and uh, why they uh, allegedly uh, seek out uh, to uh, drink and eat the blood of especially young people. That's why this stuff, you know, has gone on uh, in, in the world today. This is exactly why, you see. The ancient mystery schools of Egypt taught that the blood was the vehicle of the consciousness. Okay, so blood is the vehicle of consciousness, and there are, uh, you know, some various things that uh, make this uh, a possible truth here. Um, blood is a very important aspect of things, and this is exactly why it all has to do with consciousness. Okay. So this is important. This is why there's so much emphasis on bloodlines and stuff with all of these people in these groups. And we're going to continue on here. And things will start to get a little more interesting from here uh, <clears throat> as we read on. I really haven't needed to put many asides in here uh, because, uh, well, basically, uh, Mr. Manly P. Hall here is telling you... Uh, all of the different things that they believe at the highest, most levels of Freemasonry and uh, the Rosicrucians and all these other secret brotherhoods. Uh, they're telling you all, all of these different uh, things that they believe that they don't want the profane to know. And uh, there's a lot of important stuff in here. Now, whether you believe any of this stuff or not is immaterial because what you need to understand is there are people in positions of power in this world that do thoroughly believe this and act upon this information. And there are occult secrets being held from us by people in positions of power. And some of these things have truths behind them, and others of them are twisted perversions of what the ancient alchemists really taught, and are twisted perversions of what uh, our religions and ideas really were taught in, in their origins. So this uh, really twists around some different ideas of Christianity, and we'll see how here later, because the way they speak of Christianity, they, they kind of uh, try to have it both ways with how they, they want to uh, portray it. And, and we'll see that as we continue on. But let's continue on here. We left off here <coughs> with this sentence. The mystery schools of ancient Egypt taught that the blood was the vehicle of the consciousness. The spirit of man traveled through the bloodstream and therefore was not actually located in any one part of the compound organism. It moved through the body with the rapidity of thought, so that consciousness of self, cognition of externals, and sense perception could be localized in any part of the body by the exercise of the willpower. The initiates view the blood as a mysterious liquid, somewhat gaseous in nature which served as a medium for manifesting the fire of man's spiritual nature. This fire, coursing through the system, animated and vitalized all the parts of the form, thus keeping the spiritual nature in touch with all its physical extremities. The mystics looked upon the liver as the source of the heat and power in the blood. Hence it is significant that the spear of the centurion should pierce the liver of Christ, and the vulture should be placed over the liver of Prometheus to torment him throughout the ages. And a pause there again, folks. This is also an important idea. They're, they're talking about the liver, okay? <coughs> You're going to, going to need to pay attention here, because there's going to be some pretty telling things that come about later, especially when we do part two of this reading. And uh, you're going to be very surprised, uh, some of the information that they've kept hidden from us for so long, and, you know, what actually it entails. <coughs> Let's continue on. Occultism teaches that it is the presence of the liver which distinguishes the animal from the plant, and that mystically certain small creatures having power of motion but no liver are actually plants in spiritual consciousness. 
the liver is under the control of the planet Mars, which is the dynamo of this solar system, and which sends a red animating ray to all the evolving creatures within this solar scheme. The philosophers taught that the planet Mars, under the control of its regent Samael, pay attention to that, Samael, we're talking about the fallen angel Samael, was the transmuted sin body of the solar logos which originally had been the dweller on the threshold of the divine creature whose energies are now distributed through the fire of the sun. Samael, incidentally, was the fiery father of Cain, through whom a part of humanity has received the flame of aspiration and are thus separate from the sons of Seth, whose father was Jehovah. Going to pause there again, folks. Um, I, I think we went over this in one of the other videos I just did, didn't we? Uh, you see, this is what it's all about. They believe that they are part of a semi-divine bloodline, the bloodline of Cain, and that those of the rest of us are part of the bloodline of Seth. Uh, and they have this fascination with bloodlines and with blood and with RH factor, okay? This is why, whether there's truth to this or not, is immaterial. They believe this and they act upon it. Um, so this is what we're talking about. They think that they are um, semi-divine, that they're actually uh, partially gods, and that they should have the divine right to rule, and they have the divine right to keep these secrets over us and this control over us. But let's get back to the reading here. The Egyptians considered the juice of the grape to be more nearly hu like human blood than any other substance. In fact, they believed that the grape secured its life from the blood of the dead who had been buried in the earth. Concerning this subject, Plutarch writes as follows, The priests of the sun and Heliopolis never carry any wine into their temples. And if they made use of it at any time in their libations to the gods, it was not because they looked upon it, as in its own nature acceptable to them, but they poured it upon their altars as the blood of those enemies who formerly had fought against them. For they look upon the vine to have first sprung out of the earth after it was fattened with the carcasses of those who fell in the wars against the gods. And this, say they, is the reason why drinking its juice in great quantities makes men mad, and besides themselves, filling them, as it were, with the blood of their own ancestors. And it says in parentheses here, Isis and Osiris. The magicians of the Middle Ages were aware of the fact that they, by their occult powers, could control any person by first securing a small amount of his blood. Gonna pause right there, folks. You hear that? The magicians were well aware of the fact that by their occult powers they could control any person by first securing a small amount of his blood. Why are they connect collecting our genetic material in programs like uh, 23andMe and Ancestry.com? Why are they, uh, you know, uh, doing these tests and stuff, uh, or these medical tests and collecting our medical and genomic data? Hmm, I wonder why. Well, let's continue on. If a glass of water be left overnight in a room where someone is sleeping, the next morning the water will be impregnated to such an extent with the psychic radiations of that person that anyone understanding the modus operandi may find contained in the water a complete record of the life and character of the one who occupied the room. These records are transmitted and preserved in a subtile substance which the medieval transcendentalists called the astral light an ever-present, all-pervading, fiery essence, which preserves intact the record of everything transpiring in any part of nature. Gonna pause there, folks. Uh, we just read about that uh, a little while back, didn't we? Talking about the astral light, and now you can see what is important about this. Uh, you, you see, this is one of the things that they keep secret from us. Uh, this is part of the invisible world, uh, which most people do not have any clue that even exists or that there's such a thing here all right now whether this is complete and utter nonsense or not that's open for debate okay um nobody could really in a scientific type way or you know prove any of this stuff per se this would probably be something that would be considered more subjective or experiential 
uh, but uh, I, I would not discount it so easily myself. I really think there's something to it, and I think Mr. Hall is giving us some poignant truths here. But um, you got to keep in mind that uh, anything these guys talk about, you have to take with a grain of salt, just because it's been passed down through generations that, you know, this is what they claim. This is not any guarantee. It's not just considered to be allegory, or this is not just an allegorical teaching. Okay, and that's the important thing. You have to kind of keep these things in mind as just concepts, just vague concepts, uh, because uh, you could see how uh, many of these different ideas could equate to modern society right now, or them trying to shape things right now, because they're talking about uh, being able to pretty much know everything about people, and you know this this astral light idea this is allegorical to the surveillance state isn't it uh, when you look at it in that way why the technological control grid set up the technocratic control grid uh, this could be kind of a false equivalent of what they call this astral light keeps a record of everything and uh, doesn't lose it so uh, you could kind of see all day long how a lot of these things could be either allegorized or, or perverted in a, a very bad way <coughs> Anyway, let's continue on. Don't want to get hung up on that point for too long. The streaming rays pouring from the face of the sun have caused it to be associated with the lion because of the shaggy mane of this king of beasts. The golden-haired savior gods of many nations subtly signify by their uncut locks the solar radiations. The sun was the king of heaven, and earthly rulers desiring to advertise their terrestrial power delighted to be considered as little suns, their vassals being viewed as planets basking in the glory of the central light. The highest of each kingdom in nature was also considered symbolic of the sun, hence the scarab beetle being the most intelligent of all insects, the eagle the most aspiring of all birds, and the lion the strongest of all beasts were considered fitly symbolic of the solar disk. Thus, the Mughals chose the lion for their standard, while Caesar and Napoleon used the eagle to symbolize their dignity. The crowns of kings were originally bands of gold with radiating points to symbolize that they partook in part of the divine power vested in the sun. As time went on, the crown was conventionalized. Its surface was encrusted with jewels. A number of its points were changed, and its evident resemblance to the sun was lost. The halo so often pictured around the heads of both Christian and pagan deities and saints is also emblematic of the sun power. According to the mysteries, there comes a time in the spiritual unfoldment of man when the mysterious oil which has been moving slowly up the spinal column finally enters the third ventricle of the brain, where it becomes beautifully golden in color and radiates in all directions. This radiance is so great that it cannot be limited by the skull, and it pours out from the head, especially from the back of the neck, where the uppermost ver vertebra of the spine articulates with the condyles of the occipital bone. It is this light pouring out in a fan-shaped aura around the posterior part of the head that has given rise to the halos of saints and the nimbus so often used in religious art. This light signifies human regeneration, and it forms part of the auric bodies of man. These auras have greatly influenced the color and form of the garments used in religious ceremonials. The robe of blue and gold, which Albert Pike speaks of, and the vestments of the different degrees in the hierarchies of all religious orders are symbolic of these invisible emanations, forms which surround man, their colors changing with his every thought and feeling. By means of these auras, the priests and philosophers of the ancient world chose those disciples who would do credit to their teachings. The robes of glory of the high priest of Israel are all symbolic, as Josephus, with his oriental instruction, has shrewdly noted. The plain white linen symbolizes the purified physical nature. The many colored garments represent the astral body, the blue raiment, the spiritual nature, and the violet, the mind, for it is the color made up of two shades. 
one spiritual and the other material. I'm going to pause right there, folks. We're talking about purple being the combination of blue and red, the masculine, the feminine, the electric, the magnetic combined together. This is an important concept, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a little more into that later, I'm sure. <clears throat> Let's get back to the reading. In the Egyptian mysteries, it was not uncommon to show the rays of the sun ending in human hands. One of the chairs recently found in the tomb of Tutankhamun showed a sun with its rays ending in human hands. Among the ancients, the hand was the symbol of wisdom, because it was used to raise the fallen, and no man is so low in his estate as an ignorant man. The physical proclivities of the sun and its water-drawing power were used to symbolize a spiritual process in which the divine nature of man was raised or illuminated and drawn upward by the heat of the sun. These emanating rays spreading the threefold spiritual power of as love, wisdom, and truth. Okay, and we're going to pause right there, folks, because that's the end of part one of this book. And I may actually take it out uh, to three parts, because it is, you know, broken down in three parts here. And we explored an awful lot of these ideas uh, just in the first part alone, talking about fire as the universal divinity here. Okay, so they're equating this element of fire uh, to, uh, well to the creator and to creation itself and being the thing which powers uh, basically all of our religious and philosophical drives uh, and that is why they call themselves the philosophers of fire and they do make a distinction here and we'll see when we get to part two that they make distinctions from the uh, sons of Seth see these sons of Cain the sons of fire they believe themselves to be of a different line than the sons of Seth or the, the sons of the waters of faith. And uh, this is basically the whole premise that they've built our society upon through the ages. It's classic Hegelian dialectic. Okay? When it comes down to it, we've got uh, breaking down into two groups. They see themselves as being superior. They have more aspirations and they view those of us that they consider to be the sons of the waters of faith to be uh, complacent. See, that's the thing. And they've further driven this divide through the ages. They See, they, they view themselves as having a sort of moral superiority because of uh, this idea that they have more ambition than the rest of us. And they see us as being weak-willed because of it. They see themselves as being stronger. Uh, they see themselves as being the ones divinely uh, gifted to be able to rule because they see themselves as the builders, okay? They're the creators, the builders, the ones that, that make things happen. And we are the complacent, the, the sheeple, so to say. That's how they view us. Uh, we're the ones that are contented with what we have. We're content to tend to the garden and to herd the sheep and that kind of thing. That's that's the uh, the attitude that they've taken towards us, and that's why they consider themselves to be uh, better than we are. They see us as being low-minded. They see us as being contented to do uh, these these lower works, whereas they have more ambition and they want to do greater things. Whereas we are, uh, if we are parts of the the sons of Seth, the sons of uh, the waters of faith, the, the, the people that they consider these sons of the waters of faith tend to be more contented in life, okay? They, they, they tend to be more content with the simple things, living in nature, working with nature. This would be like the equivalent of, of looking at, at uh, uh, people just living off the land, being content to pick the fruit that's plenty and... Uh, utilize that a life of ease per se uh, as how they view it rather than having to till the land or work the land you see they are the ones that have more ambition they're the builders the creators the ones that actually get things done that's how they view it whereas they view uh, the other side as being the ones that are just content to uh, just take what's easily available for themselves and to live contentedly that way and these people have a, a, a spark about them, or so they claim, 
that they feel the need for more. So that is what ultimately drives them to seek power. Uh, and, and that is where we have this great divide. Because, see, they, they seek more and more and more power. Because they, they view this internal fire as a driving force behind them. Okay, And a lot of these ideas are symbolic and could be taken in allegorical ways and stuff as well. But uh, we'll see when we get to part two of this book. Things will get really interesting in the ways that they uh, go ahead and uh, compare these two different aspects of humanity. Okay, And uh, when we get there, uh, Mr. Hall will really begin to reveal a lot of uh, things that may have been hidden for a long, long time here that are, are coming to light now uh, due to the advent of the Internet and the access to these things that were never really available to the public before. So uh, books like this, uh, this little book is a treasure, treasure trove of a lot of different occult ideas and, and could really give you a, uh, a crash course in what the mysteries of the ancients taught. And... Uh, what they've brought forward in the secret societies today, what these teachings are, and what these people believe, and how and why they act on a lot of these different ideas, and how also uh, you could see how a lot of these ideas have been perverted and inverted into something totally antithetical to what they may have originally once represented. So he's talking about lofty, higher spiritual ideas, but you could see how they've been twisted and manipulated in order to drive this, this fire that they see themselves as having. Uh, what do we know about fire? Fire consumes, doesn't it? And that's, that's one of these things uh, we could see. But once again, I, I'm, you know, the important thing to point out here is the division that's been sown between mankind throughout all the ages. And it all points back to this. This is where it all comes from. This is actually uh, the same thing that goes on today with politics. Okay, If you could break this down to its most elemental type thoughts, you're thinking fire and water, Republican, Democrat. Same kind of an idea. You understand? They play one against the other. One is the more ambitious sort, and the other one just wants to be able to live comfortably and not have to work too hard for it. You see, and that's kind of the ambiguity that they put in there. They, they want to try and keep people divided and thinking along these lines, even though there may not be actual truth to that. They want them to think of their opponent in the opposite way. You know what I mean? They, they want their, these people to think that uh, they're in the right and they're the hard workers and they're the ones that deserve to be able to set policy. And the ones on, on the other side of the aisle, well, they're just the freeloaders. They're the useless eaters, you see. And they play these off against each other. And both parties are prone to this. And both parties are manipulated in this way. They See, they both think that they're the sons of fire, so to say, in this allegorical idea. So your Republicans think that they're the ambitious ones. And they're the sons of fire. And your Democrats have the same thing. They think they're the ambitious ones and are the sons of fire. And these people will try and do things to placate the ones that they consider to be their opposites, the sons of Seth, the sons of the waters of faith. Remember when Obama said that uh, we cling to our, our guns and religions? You remember that? We're bitter clingers. Do you remember that whole thing quite a few years back now? That's what he's talking about. This was a put-down for the sons of the waters of faith, you see, because they believe themselves to be superior, okay? They believe that they have this fire and that the fire is the greatest of all elements. And I know this may sound like a stretch for some people out there, but when you look at it through the lens of allegory, this is exactly what has been going on from time immemorial, and this is why we have such divides in this world right now. The division is being sown, and it's becoming deeper and deeper. That's what's going on, because it's used as a control structure, okay? And that's what it is. It's the division, dividing the fire and the water, and having them fight against each other and oppose each other, rather than working together. 
in ways that are possible. And we'll get to that later as we get further down this series. But I think I'm going to uh, bring this one to an end right here and call this part one. And uh, we will do this in three parts. And uh, this is, once again, a Manly P. Hall book called Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire, originally published 1926, Philosophical Publishing House. Um, this was Mr. Hall's own publishing company that he founded way back when. So uh, a lot of important ideas in here. If you guys could get a hold of a copy of this book, get it and read it. And your understanding uh, will increase and you will understand further why certain things are happening in the world and what the motivations are behind the people steering it. Uh, anyway, that's all I got for tonight, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me, and we'll catch you on the next one. Look forward to doing part two of Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire. Catch you later.